Good morning. My name is Marie Rienzo, and I want to welcome you to the NIH Office of Disease Prevention's Mind the Gap webinar series. This series explores research design, measurement, intervention, data analysis, and other methods of interest to prevention science. Our goal is to engage the prevention research community in thought-provoking discussions to promote the use of the best available methods and to, to support the development of better methods. Before we begin, I have some housekeeping items. To submit questions during the webinar, there are two options. First, you may submit questions via WebEx by clicking on the question mark in the WebEx toolbar. Please direct your questions to all panelists. Second, you may participate by Twitter and submit questions using the hashtag NIHMTG. At the conclusion of today's talk, we will open the floor to questions that have been submitted via WebEx and Twitter. Lastly, we would appreciate your feedback about today's webinar. Upon closing the WebEx meeting, you will be directed to a website to complete an evaluation. We would appreciate your feedback as it will help us improve this webinar series. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. David M. Murray, Associate Director for Prevention and Director of the Office of Disease Prevention. Thank you, Marie. Today's speaker is Dr. Jacob Bohr. Dr. Bohr is Assistant Professor and Peter T. Paul Career Development Professor in the Departments of Global Health and Epidemiology at Boston University. His research applies the analytical tools of economics and data science to the study of population health, with a focus on HIV treatment and prevention in Southern Africa. Dr. Bohr was also ODP's 2018 Early Stage Investigator Lecture winner, and we're delighted to have him back with us uh, today. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Bohr. Thank you very much, David. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and to be able to share uh, some thoughts, a little bit of my research, but also a broad overview of progression discontinuity designs and public health research. Um, I don't know whether this uh, cartoon image that you're seeing on the, on, on the, the title slide is used in all of your um, for, for all of the lectures for this series, but it is, um, it, it's, it's the perfect image for what I'm going to, going to talk about today. You have here a person on a subway platform who is about to step into the abyss, and the question about whether he crosses over this threshold or, or not has very important implications for his fate. And so just take that with you as we go through the next, through the next half hour or so of, uh, of, this, of this presentation. So I, I'd like to start out with a, with a quote. Um, As is the case for any observational study, our results might be affected by unme unmeasured confounding factors. So who has said that? I've said that. Perhaps you have said that. Perhaps every epidemiologist and social scientist has said, has said this. In my doctoral studies, I remember this being drummed into us as the sort of required sentence in the discussion section, just as, as if to say, whatever you just read, take it with a grain of salt. It might not be true. This particular quote comes from the When to Start Consortium, uh, a, a big paper um, on the timing of, of HIV treatment in, um, that was published in The Lancet in 2009, but this could have been taken from any number of papers. When we, when we think about health research and causality in health research, we typically have, have, have two ideal cases. We have randomized controlled trials on the one hand, and we have observational studies on the other. And the, these, these two uh, ideal cases are, are, are what you see in WHO um, in, in, in grade guidelines, for example, to, 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 to grade the quality of evidence that's considered in WHO recommendations. Um, and randomized controlled trials, of course, have high internal validity because of randomization. They achieve balance on both, unobserved, both observed and unobserved covariates. Um, but RCTs face some constraints in terms of when an RCT can actually be done. They're more, often more costly. There may be ethical constraints if equipoise can't be established. And there's a limit on the range of types of exposures that one can do in a, a clinical trial for. On the other hand, observational studies may have better external validity, um, but they, have, they may achieve balance only on observables and require the strong assumption, the disclaimer that I mentioned a slide ago. 
quasi-experimental studies draw, seek to draw from the strengths of both of these approaches. Quasi-experiments exploit quasi-random variation that occurs naturally in the world or in an administrative rule uh, in order to estimate causal effects. In quasi-experiments, there's potential for balance on both observed and unobserved factors similar to an RCT, but because the data are often observational, there are fewer ethical and financial constraints on, uh, to analyzing quasi-experiments, and there's a, a wider range of exposures that one might be interested in for prevention science um, that one can look at. And finally, it allows you to evaluate programs at scale as implemented in real life non-trial settings, which is important for understanding some of the beha behavioral pathways, uh, uh, the behavioral uh, in, in impacts of interventions, as I'll discuss later in the presentation. So today I'll talk about one particular quasi-experimental design, the regression discontinuity design, provide an overview of RDD, provide the, 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 a little bit of the theory behind causal inference in regression discontinuity designs, show how you would estimate a treatment effect in an, RD in an RD design, talk through a few examples of regression discontinuity in the health literature, and finally deal with a very common type of regression discontinuity design in which, uh, which is RDD with noncompliance or fuzzy RDD. So regression discontinuity can be implemented whenever treatment ass is assigned, at least in part, by a threshold rule on a continuous baseline variable. It's easiest to think about this with an example. So for a long time uh, in South Africa before two that, prior to 2011, um, there was a CD4 count threshold for eligibility for HIV treatment. So if a person's CD4 count uh, was below 200 cells, then they were eligible to initiate HIV therapy. If their CD4 count was above 200 cells, then they were instructed to return in six months for reassessment of eligibility. And the intuition behind, uh, behind regression discontinuity is that because of this threshold rule, patients presenting just above and below 200 cells are essentially identical and are expected to be similar on both observed and unobserved characteristics, similar to an RCT, but they're assigned different exposures, treatment eligibility on the one hand and deferred eligibility on the other hand. In this, in this study that, uh, that co-authors and I published in 2014 in epidemiolo epidemiology, we provided a, a primer on RDD for epidemiologists, um, and we also used that example that I just described to show how RDD can be used in, in clinical and epi epidemiological sciences. And this is actually the first application of RDD, to our knowledge, um, to a clinical threshold rule in, a, in an epidemiolo epidemiology public health or, or clinical sciences journal. So what we looked at was the effect of immediate versus deferred art eligibility on treatment uptake and survival. And so this plot shows you the distribution of first CD4 counts when, when a person presents for care. And, the, and these are data from rural South Africa, from the African Health Research Institute, um, about two hours north of Durban, if, if people are familiar. Um, the way care works is that someone comes into the clinic, tests positive for HIV, and then blood is immediately drawn and sent to the labs for a CD4 count. So this first CD4 count is really CD4 count at diagnosis, at entry into care. And these are, this is just the, 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 the distribution of CD4 counts um, amongst people presenting for care. And you see this is quite, this is quite smooth. This is just a histogram showing, showing that people are presenting it at various CD4 counts, both above and below the threshold. There's substantial noise in these CD4 counts due to measurement error, due to random fluctuations. So where you are right around the 200, uh, whether you're, um, you're just above or, or below the 200 threshold is substantially random. And yet it has really important implications for whether you start treatment. So this plot shows the probability of starting treatment. Uh, ART is antiretroviral therapy here whether you start treatment within six months after that first CD4 count. And what you can see is that, um, since I've lost my, my cursor, uh, what, what, what you can see is that just below the 200 cell threshold, uh, about 70% of people or two thirds of people were starting treatment within six months. Just above the 200 cell threshold, only about a third of people were starting treatment within six months. 
And the impact of immediate eligibility was to increase the chances of starting treatment by 32 percentage points. And so this is called regression discontinuity because at this threshold, there's a discontinuity in the likelihood of being exposed. And that discontinuity is exploited as a natural experiment in order to identify impacts on, on outcomes. So causal effects can be estimated simply by comparing patients presenting above and below the threshold. And so we can, we can, identi we can identify effect measures either as ratios or differences in, in, in uptake or in other outcomes at the threshold. And in certain settings, as I'll discuss, uh, no assumptions are actually required about unmeasured confounding factors, making uh, distinguishing regression discontinuity designs from other observational studies. This is the, the effect now of HIV treatment eligibility on survival. So here, patients were, this is a, a unique setting to do this study. We were able to link patients to longitudinal demographic surveillance data. So we actually had very good gold standard information on, on survival. And what we saw was that patients presenting just below the 200 threshold, who had slightly lower CD4 counts, and were in slightly worse health on average, actually had better survival or lower mortality than patients presenting just above the threshold. And so the intent to treat impact of HIV treatment eligibility on, on mortality was a reduction in the, in the hazard of death of, uh, of 35%. And so this, was, this, 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 this is what we published in the 2014 article in epidemiology. So this is a so this is sort of the overview of how this works, and now we'll we'll unpack this um, a bit going forward. The original regression discontinuity study actually came from the educational psychology literature, this uh, this study by Thistlethwaite and Campbell, um, where they looked at the the PSAT and looked at PSAT scores, where they wanted to know whether if you if you scored above a certain threshold and received a certificate of merit whether that led to changes in, 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 in later educational, educational outcomes. Since, since its inception in the 60s, RDD has really um, had an interesting history. It was practiced primarily, promoted primarily in this sort of program evaluation world um, by scholars uh, such as uh, Shadish, Cook, and Campbell um, in these papers that, that, I, that I list, list in sort of the, in, 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 in books uh, that I list here at the top. Since the late 90s, um, economists started to take quite an interest in regression discontinuity designs. And there were a number of papers, including the, some of the ones that I'm listing here, that established um, some of the methodolog theoretical and methodological underpinnings of regression discontinuity designs and form, form the basis for how people are to think about and analyze uh, regression discontinuity designs today. In terms of clinical and public health research, in 2014, 2015, um, at the same time as, 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 that we had published that other article, we, we, um, we were interested in just how, you know, how, how much, how, how many sort of existing papers have there been on RDD in the health literature? And we found just 32 empirical RDD papers in PubMed, and just two of those studies looked at clinical thresholds with physical health outcomes. Um, Almond study on 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 on, um, on low birth weight, and and then our, and then our study on on CD4 counts and, and HIV treatment. So this was this was still sort of nascent just a few years ago. It's now grown substantially, um, and sort of the highest data point there in terms of PubMed results for regression discontinuity designs is this year at 48, and this year isn't even done. So um, you know we really see this as as um, there's, there's an increasing interest and acceptance and use of RDD in, in the health literature. So how are we able to identify causal effects in regression discontinuity designs? So I, I, I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation here. We can imagine two potential outcomes for an individual I. We can imagine outcome Y1 if that person is treatment eligible and why not, why zero, and a completely counterfactual unobserved state of the world if that person had not been eligible for treatment. 
And so this is this is one this 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 framework um, uh, which was developed by 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 Rubin and and others has been has been the primary way that people have thought about regression discontinuity designs and, and other um, quasi experiments. Um, so our goal is to make comparisons between y1 and y0. The problem is that y1 and y0 are never observed for the same individual in, in truth. And so we need to identify two comparable populations, one that's treated for whom we observe y1 and one that's not treated for whom we observe y0. And if those populations are comparable, then the difference between outcomes in those populations will be a um, can be interpreted as a, as a causal treatment effect. If they're not comparable, then it's confounded and, and cannot be interpreted as a causal effect. So the setup for regression discontinuity is that we imagine that we have these, these different potential outcomes, if eligible, if not eligible, and then we have a continuous uh, treatment assignment variable, CD4 count in our example, distance from the yellow line on, this, on the subway platform on the intro slide, for example. Um, and the threshold rule says that someone is el eligible for, for the treatment or the exposure if the assignment variable is less than or greater than some threshold. And so what we're going to be playing with here are objects called the potential outcome conditional expectation functions, or POSEPs. And these are the average outcomes that one would observe if treatment eligible at different values of z on the one hand. And then on the other hand, the average outcomes one would observe if not eligible at different outcomes of z. So here's a picture of that. The top line, you can imagine this as, 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 as corresponding to our study on CD4 counts and mortality. Um, the, the top line shows the potential outcomes if not treatment eligible, the expected mortality rate um, at different CD4 counts, let's say. The bottom line shows the potential outcomes if treatment eligible at different CD4 counts. The idea behind the potential outcomes framework is that theoretically, theoretically both of these lines could exist both, uh, through, through both the solid and dotted uh, aspects of, of, of these lines. But in fact, in the observed data, we only observe the solid lines. So we might like to compare patients at different CD4 counts who are eligible or not eligible, um, but we actually, we don't observe that across the whole distribution of CD4 counts. We do, however, observe that at this threshold C. So the theory behind RD is that in the limit, as we approach the threshold from above and below, the observed values of the, the observed mean outcomes just above the threshold and just above the threshold are estimates of the potential outcome conditional expectation functions at the threshold. Potential outcomes if observed, if, excuse, excuse me, if treated and if not treated. And so this allows us at the threshold to identify a causal effect, which is the comparison of people in this neighborhood around the threshold who just happen to be above or just happen to be below the threshold and receive different treatment assignments, but were otherwise similar. In order to make, in order to implement this design, we need a few assumptions. The first is that the threshold rule exists and that the threshold is known. The second is that the, is that the assignment variable is continuous near the threshold so that we can imagine uh, getting infinitely close to the, to the threshold and taking limits. The third, which is really the key assumption, is that we have continuity in these, in these lines. So just going back for a moment, if there was a jump in the threshold in either the blue line or the red line, then they wouldn't be a good counterfactual for each other at the threshold. So that's the key assumption is that the blue line as you approach from above is a good counterfactual for the red line, um, even though the red line above the threshold is not, is not observed. So is that a strong assumption? Is this continuity assumption a strong assumption? Let's take one case, which is a geographical boundary. So in New Hampshire, they have lower cigarette taxes than we have in Massachusetts. And so I might be interested in using distance from the New Hampshire boundary 
as um, as a way to, to, to look at the impact of cigarette taxes on smoking. So is do we believe that there's continuity in smoking rates at the threshold and that this can be linked to cigarette tax? Well, there's this this is a case where where we might think about other possible explanations. So taxes are different and policies are different for a whole range of things beyond cigarette taxes. Um, and so this geographic boundary may not work so well in this instance um, in, in, in terms of justifying this assumption. On the other hand, what if we have a laboratory measure on a clinical biomarker that determines, uh, that determines treatment? In this case, we can actually identify off of the random noise inherent in that laboratory measure. So when you take CD4 counts, there's random noise, there's, there are random daily and hourly fluctuations in CD4 counts. When you take a blood sample, it's a sample from an underlying population, and there's sampling variability in that sample. There's also measurement error in terms of the machines used at the laboratory to measure CD4 counts. And so when you look at that variability in measured CD4 counts, it's quite substantial. And because there's measurement error, that measurement error in the assignment variable actually guarantees continuity in potential outcomes at the threshold, so long as people aren't able to directly manipulate the values of their CD4 counts. Manipulation of those values can be assessed in the data and can also be sort of assessed for plausibility. In our case, uh, the data came directly from the labs, and so there, before, the, before the providers or patients even knew about the results of, the, of those CD4 tests, so there really wasn't any scope for manipulation, but it can also be assessed in, in, in the data by looking at um, gaps in the density of the assignment variable around the threshold. This is a test that Justin McCrary um, pioneered, where he, he's, the intuition is that if patients or providers change their values of Z, the assignment variable, in order to gain or avoid access to the treatment, this will result in a in bunching of, of, of values and a higher density of, of values of the assignment variable on one side or the other of this threshold. And so we would see discontinuity in the density of the assignment variable. So this is a test, and I showed you the histogram at the very beginning to show that, there were, that, that the density was, was continuous across the threshold. The second test we can do, which is similar to, uh, to a balance table in an RCT, is to look at uh, continuity at the threshold in observables. So I just said that regression discontinuity gives you continuity, uh, gives you continuity both in observed factors and in unobserved factors. Well, just like an RCT, we, we can't prove that there's balance in unobservables, but we can show balance in observed factors as evidence that the mechanism for treatment assignment, the random mechanism for treatment assignment that we think occurred, was actually the mechanism of treatment assignment that did occur. And so this is one example uh, of, of showing um, continuity in the baseline covariate um, at the threshold. And of course, the, the intuition is that patients just above and below the threshold are similar on all baseline covariates, both observed and unobserved. And we can show that balance, that continuity in observed covariates. When it comes, so, so, how do, so that's sort of the intuition behind causal inference. So we're identifying a treatment effect at the threshold. And we're able to, uh, to, to identify it because of this assumption of continuity at the threshold in the potential outcomes. So how do we estimate the, these treatment effects? Well, we, we'd like these two values, these two values of the observed conditional expectation function, i.e. the observed mean values of the outcome as we approach C, as Z approaches C from above, and as Z approaches C from below. Those two points at the threshold that are shown with those arrows. So those can be estimated in the data, and, and from those we can make inferences about these two potential outcome means at the threshold. So how do we estimate those in the data? Well, the, the traditional approach is to run a, a linear, a very simple linear regression model in which we have an intercept, in which we have 
a continuous term for the assignment variable and, uh, and allow for different slopes on either side of the threshold. And then we have an intercept shift at the threshold. And so I've written out the equation uh, there at the top. If we look at the, if we look at the, the, the graph in the, in, the, in the bottom, we can see what these different coefficients represent. So the intercept shows us the value at the threshold um, just, just above the threshold here without, without the treatment. So that's the, that's the mean in the control group, as it were. Um, beta 1 shows you the slope above, here, in this case, above the threshold um, where people are not eligible for treatment. The slope below the threshold where people are, are eligible for treatment is just the sum of the coefficients beta 1 and beta 3. And beta 2 is the treatment effect, which is, this, which is the difference in means at the threshold. Importantly, in this equation, you can see that we've, that we've um, centered the assignment variable at C. So we've subtracted 200 from the CD4 count value so that the assignment variable is, is essentially a plus or minus distance from this threshold. And when, um, when, when Z equals C, then those terms are zero. And both beta 1 and beta 3 drop out of the drop out of the model. So this is this is how this is how people identify RDD treatment effects. And the thing in and, and the, the objects here of interest, the main object here of interest is beta 2. And um, but we, we can also look at beta naught and beta naught plus beta 1 as the treatment and, and control group uh, treated and control means at the threshold. There are a bunch of reasons to favor local linear regression uh, which are which are listed here. One common question is how to choose how big a bandwidth, how big a window of data one should use around the threshold. And there are data-driven bandwidth selection routines um, that, uh, that, that are the best way of doing that. Um, the alternative, which is sort of for the researcher to pick whatever they think is the nicest bandwidth, doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. And there's potential for, um, you know, for, for cherry picking. And so the, the recommendation here is to, is, is to declare a particular data-driven bandwidth selection method a priori, and then that selection method will generate a bandwidth that becomes that, that's used in the, in the analysis. And the other guidance throughout throughout the RD literature is that it's important to show lots of show robustness to lots of different bandwidths. So how should we interpret these effect estimates? So the RD effect is a causal effect at the threshold. Well, is that so useful? So, you know, I, when I hear criticism of this, of this, uh, of, of the design, criticism, the criticism is, is primarily, great, you've identified a causal effect at one point, why do we care about the causal effect at that one point? And so I want to provide a little bit of interpretation about how we should think about that causal effect. And the first is to say, if we were to assume constant treatment effects, then that causal effect is the same causal effect that we would observe in an RCT. Now, constant treatment effects is a strong assumption, but it's a common assumption in, in, in epidemiological research. Secondly, if effects, if treatment effects were heterogeneous, non-constant, but they were independent of the assignment variable, then RDD would also identify the same causal effect as an RCT. So we only really have a problem here if treatment effects are heterogeneous and the size of the treatment effect is correlated with the assignment variable. And in that case, the RDD effect identifies a local average causal effect, where it can be thought of as local to the area around the threshold. Um, but it's not necessarily just the effect at the threshold, because as described earlier, there's substantial measurement error in, in if there's substantial noise or measurement error, um, in, in values of the assignment variable, then we can think of that causal effect as being a causal effect across, as a sort of a weighted average of causal effects across a region with true CD4 counts that had measured CD4 counts at 200. So there's quite a wide range of true CD4 counts that give rise to a measured CD4 count of 200. And so 
to think of this as, as, as a hyper-local hyper -local effect with very limited generalizability isn't necessarily correct. The other point to make is that the local effect, i.e. the effect, um, the effect at the threshold is exactly the effect that we would anticipate if we marginally increase the threshold. Often that's the policy option that's, that, that's available to us. Should we change the threshold? Should we, increase, should, we, should we increase it a little bit? Should we lower it a little bit? And so the local effect is precisely that effect estimate. And that's something that's actually not available in most randomized controlled trials unless they are, are very large and, 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 and high enough powered to identify treatment effect heterogeneity with, um, with the assignment variable covariance. So I want to run through a few examples. I've given our example, which is a clinical example, but there are many, many more in, in public health that, that may sort of pique your, um, your, your imagination and, and, and curiosity. So um, Almond et al. look at uh, the low birth weight cutoff um, and find that infants born with uh, birth weights below 1,500 gram, uh, below 1,500 grams, I believe this is for very low birth weight, um, had higher mortality. Um, and, uh, excuse me, the, 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 the infants born just below the, the very low birth weight threshold were identified as being very low birth weight, had, were more likely to receive intensive neonatal intervention, and actually had lower mortality than babies that were born just above this threshold. And they used this to, to, to calculate the cost effectiveness of, um, of, of neonatal care provided for uh, very low birth weight infants. Carpenter and Dobkin look at the impact of, uh, of, of drinking age rules on, uh, on mortality. And so this is a bit of a, a dense plot, but the, the primary plot here to, to look at is the top one, which show, shows motor vehicle accidents, MVA, and shows that as people, there's generally a declining rate of motor vehicle accidents as people get older, but there's a sharp increase at age 21 when people are eligible to legally drink. Chen et al. looked at a very interesting policy called the Huai River policy in China, which um, provided subsidies for um, for, for, for coal burn, for coal heating in the north of China, but not in, in the south of China. And they used distance from this, from this Huai River, which was sort of above the river, you were eligible for this and below you were not, um, in order to identify differences in air pollution, um, which is the, the, the TSP here uh, on, the, on, the, on the bottom left, and, uh, in and then differences in, in life expectancy and use this as, as a way to estimate the impact of air pollution on, on life expectancy in China. Ludwig and Miller uh, looked at um, the rollout of Head Start programs in the 60s. And they, they, they um, as, is, as, is, as is often common in these RD studies, a lot of the hard work is finding, finding the natural experiment and figuring out precisely how um, how treatment was assigned and obtaining the data necessary to, 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 to recreate that. And so it turns out that when Head Start was first rolled out in the 60s, there was additional sort of uh, federal funding, but also hand-holding to particular commu low-income communities, low-income counties, um, uh, to, to, to help them to get Head Start programs started. Um, and this is out of a recognition that counties might need some extra handholding in, in, in order to um, in, in order to implement these programs, and so that uh, the determination of whether a locality was in a high poverty county was based on the poverty rate in the 1960 census. And so what so what Ludwig and Miller do is they extract the data on poverty on county level poverty from the 1960 census and map this on to different counties and onto head start funding and show that actually there was a discrete increase this uh, discontinuous increase in head start funding per four year old uh, by the late 60s in those higher poverty counties and that um, this actually led to reductions in in in, in um, 
in child mortality um, in, in, in later survey, in later, uh, in later years. This study just came out this past year. It's a very interesting study by, by, a, uh, by Anderson, um, who looks at women's property rights and HIV infection risk. So there's been a there's long been a sort of theory that 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 um, women's empowerment or lack of women's empowerment is substantially responsible for um, for very high rates of HIV prevalence amongst women in sub-Saharan Africa. And what Anderson did was to identify ethnic groups where there were people or where there were members of that ethnic group on both sides of the national boundary, and then to identify those sets of ethnic groups splitting national boundaries, where the two countries had different legal systems, one based in common law and one based in civil law. And these different legal systems had different protections of, of property rights for women. And so what they, what they found was that using distance to border, to, to the border as the assignment variable, and using demographic and health surveillance data to look at this, um, Anderson found uh, markedly lower uh, female HIV prevalence in these civil law countries um, where there were stronger property right protections for women compared to the common law countries. And this, the, and this um, was consistent with, with, with behavioral data on condom use as well. A study from, from Toronto, uh, Chen and colleagues looked at air pollution alerts where if the daily maximum air quality indicator is above this threshold at 48, then there's a air pollution alert is announced. And people may have different uh, behavioral responses to those alerts. For example, not going outside if the air quality is very bad and if you have asthma, let's say. And so what they show is that the, um, these, air, um, these air pollution alerts were actually associated with fewer asthma ER visits, ostensibly because um, because kids with asthma uh, weren't weren't going outside and being exposed to these higher pollution levels, um, and of course the the, the, the there's a, a you can see a, a general increase in asthma ER ER visits with higher pollution levels, but there's a sharp drop um, when people are made aware that air pollution is high through these air pollution alerts. So these, are, these are just a few examples of how RDD has been used. It's also been used in, um, in, in data on, on elections. So if, if um, in a two-party election, whoever has more than 50% of the vote is the, is the winner. And so there's been a whole series of, uh, of, of papers looking at, um, looking at political elections as well as union elections as a, as a threshold rule. There are also a number of papers that look at eligibility cutoffs. Um, this is a paper by Laura, uh, Laura uh, I don't know if it's Dag or, da or Dagu, um, uh, who looked at Medicaid premiums and rates of enrollment. Um, adults were more likely to stay enrolled if they didn't have to pay a premium. So this shows income as a percent of federal poverty line and the length of time that someone was on Medicaid. And at 150% of the poverty line, the premium goes from zero to ten dollars a month, and even though this isn't a very this isn't very much money, um, it has a huge impact on enrollment. And so this is an important paper because it shows that that it's it's probably not the amount of money, and much more likely the sort of the hassle costs of of paying the premium or thinking about insurance as a as, as a monetary cost. So this is this these examples give give you a sense of the range of. Of the, of, the, of the range of, of examples that RD can be used for. I'm going to quickly go through a last, a, a last uh, point about RDD with noncompliance. Most of these studies that I've shown you involve a threshold rule that influences treatment assignment, but does not determine, deterministically say whether treatment is on or off. Right? So what if the threshold rule only applies to some patients? What if there are other indications for treatment? In our HIV treatment example, stage four illness or contraindications for treatment? Um, or what if some patients opt out 
despite being el being eligible for religious reasons or because they don't have the money to, to come back to the clinic? Or what if some patients opt in despite being not eligible because they, they're really strongly motivated and aren't going to advocate for themselves no matter what? These cases make RDD very similar to, to clinical encouragement trials in which you have noncompliance on both sides. And this is very common and, and is really the vast majority of RD designs are of this type. Um, and it's known as fuzzy RDD, uh, which I think is sort of a misnomer, but, but that's what it's called. Um, and, 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 and we extended the, the previous work that we did at the 200 threshold to look at a higher 350 threshold for HIV treatment. And this was in PLOS Medicine uh, last year, where we specifically uh, impl implemented a fuzzy regression discontinuity design. So here is a, a similar story to, to previously being eligible for treatment substantially and discontinuously increased the probability of, of starting treatment within six months. Here the risk difference is 25 percentage points. And we can think of this as describing three groups. So even though, even though all patients at the threshold are either above or below, some of those patients would have initiated ART regardless. And we call those always takers. And that's that 15% um, who would have initiated even if they were above the threshold. Most patients, unfortunately, were not going to initiate ART even if they were eligible. And we call those never takers who are the people above the threshold. And sorry, it's the people above the, 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 top, the top line. The people for whom the threshold binds are called compliers. And so one way to interpret this plot is to say that the threshold binds for 25% of the population. For 25% of the population, um, their treatment decision was based on which side of this threshold they were on. And in this situation, we're going to interpret the overall effect of being below the threshold as an intent to treat effect. And similar to other randomized trials, uh, randomized encouragement designs where we have noncompliance, the effect of the treatment itself can be recovered using the threshold rule or randomization in the, in the trial as an instrumental variable. That is, we're going to scale the intent to treat effect by the share of patients whose treatment status was determined by the threshold rule, these compliers, assuming that there was no effect of eligibility on outcomes for people who either would have initiated regardless of eligibility or would not have initiated regardless of, of, of eligibility. And so the intent to treat effect is a 17 percentage point increase in retention and care. This is the key outcome we were looking at. And looking at this effect specifically on patients whose treatment decision was based on the eligibility threshold, we found that immediate treatment eligibility increased 12 months retention by 70 percentage points amongst these patients for whom the threshold binds. And this is a, a valid causal estimate under additional assumptions of excludability and monotonicity, which uh, we don't have time to discuss right now, but I can talk about in the, in the discussion section if, if that would be helpful. Further analysis revealed that amongst this group of compliers, immediate eligibility increased retention from 21% to 91%. That was the gap. That, that was the 70 percentage point gap. So this is a huge increase in retention amongst people for whom the threshold binds. And what's interesting about this is that WHO guidelines um, have, have, have been made primarily based on clinical trials. Um, and the, the three important clinical trials for this question of immediate versus deferred therapy, the HBT and 052 start in Temprano trials all made, went to great efforts to make sure that the control group in those trials was retained in care. And so the red and blue uh, bars here show the proportion retained in those trials um, by treatment arm. And it's essentially the same, very high in both, in both arms. Our study in Flavisa um, uh, found, in contrast, that that, that, that immediate uh, treatment eligibility for those patients who would be willing to take up treatment, which are those patients that we would think would consent to be in one of these trials, 
that immediate treatment eligibility dramatically improved retention and that without immediate treatment eligibility and without the additional handholding that we saw in these trials, um, the, the, the rate of retention would have been much, much lower. So whereas most of the, the, the benefits in the clinical trials literature of immediate ART eligibility have been conceived as biologic benefits, there's this other completely separate behavioral pathway that may be really, really important and lead people to, to, um, to, to return to care only much, much later when they're very sick um, and when they've had lots of opportunity to potentially transmit the virus to other people. So it, as, as, as a recap, RDD offers a rigorous approach to causal inference when an exposure or treatment is assigned by a threshold rule. It's been described as second only to, to an RCT in terms of its internal validity. And this comes from this notion of local randomization, where noise in the assignment variable um, sort of randomly allocates patients or units to being just above or just below this threshold and guarantees continuity in the potential outcome conditional expectation functions. Incre there's been increasing use of RDD in public health and medicine. Um, there are lots of, pot of potential use cases that haven't been exploited yet. Clinical thresholds are sort of a classic case, and there's still very few studies that, that use clinical thresholds, but there are many other applications too. RD RDDs have obvious benefits over observational studies in terms of the ability to make causal statements without the, that very strong assumption of no residual confounding. But they also have benefits over RCTs in some cases. They're, they're lower cost. They enable evaluations of difficult to randomize interventions. For example, legal systems as shown in the Anderson paper. Um, they are typically, they, they enable analysis of population representative data um, rather than trials which require opt-in consent and often have very selected samples. And they enable analyses of interventions as implemented in real world settings uh, where, where the control group really is receiving the true standard of care. Um, and as we saw from, from the PLOS Medicine example, um, there's a real difference between true standard of care and what standard of care is in many trials. The key limitation is that regression discontinuity designs are not always available as an option. Threshold rules don't always exist, but they're more common than you'd think. And a lot of the fun uh, in, this, in this line of work is trying to identify creative uh, natural experiments and finding those threshold rules um, that, 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 that may be sort of just, about over, the, over, the, just over the horizon. Um, and there's some detective work in that, which is very interesting. It sort of complements the, uh, the, the statistical and empirical work. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And we have a, about, so still, still have about 13 minutes for, for discussion. I look forward to your questions. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, uh, terrific presentation. Um, let's start with a question about the nature of these studies that you, uh, some of the examples that you gave, and you listed a bunch of references at, on one slide that we saw just briefly. Um, how many of these were established as RDD studies uh, from the outset? That is, these were prospective studies where they were planned as RDDs. And how many of these were retrospective studies where uh, you or someone uh, dug into the uh, uh, situation, the data, discovered that you could analyze it as an RDD and did that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. There's nothing that says that you cannot design a prospective RDD. Um, an advantage to doing so would be that you really are aware of the data generating process. It's not sort of that's not a part of the inferences that you're making about what the true data generating process was. Um, you know, you can imagine doing that in a situation in which you had a sort of quite clear ethical case that people, you know, maybe you had a risk score and you had quite a clear case that people with higher levels of this risk score we want to allocate to some intervention. We don't feel comfortable randomizing people with high levels of the risk score to that intervention but we could use a sharp cutoff and then analyze at that threshold um, uh, whether people just above, above and below the, that eligibility threshold um, benefited from the intervention. So you can, from, from an ethical standpoint, you can imagine that being a, um, a very reasonable way to conduct a prospective study. It, 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 it would have less statistical power than the RCT 
and it would also not allow you to identify treatment effects at, at other points along that risk score. So that's a drawback in that situation, um, but it's certainly possible. I think all of the examples that I described were retrospective analyses of large administrative or household survey data sets. And, I, you know, I think it's certainly, it's certainly possible to do prospective RCTs. And actually, I have some work um, with, uh, um, with, with, with uh, uh, um, intensive care uh, implementation science expert on using prospective RDD for continuous uh, quality improvement. Although this is possible, I think a lot of the power of RDD is being able to find these experiments that exist in the world with the plethora of data sources that, 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 that we have. And there's all this data hanging around waiting to be used, administrative data, large household surveys. And if you can find an experiment that you can then link to those, uh, to, to those administrative or, or survey data, then it can be really powerful. And it can be really powerful um, for, for the reasons that I sort of described, that you can identify interventions implemented in real-world settings without investigator interference at scale, um, and in you know population representative and rel population relevant samples, which is not always the case in prospective uh, programs because you know studies might uh, investigator led studies are often are often smaller. Um, I, I can uh, mention that one of my master's students when I was at Ohio State actually did a prospective um, RDD. Uh, it was an interesting example, and as we talked about the study that he wanted to do for his uh, NPH project, uh, it seemed like a natural. So, uh, uh, not sure that he's ever published that, but uh, I, I agree with you that it's it's possible to do it. Yeah. Interesting that most of the uh, or all of the examples that you've shown us have been uh, retrospective. Um, we have a question uh, from our listeners about. Um, whether the uh, assignment variable uh, should always be some kind of a hard, you know, biological measure, or whether you can use self-report measures as the assignment uh, score, uh, does it matter? That's that's a great question. So the the assignment variable needs to be used in the treatment decision, or or in determining the exposure. So. Say that there was a, say for example, that, that um, uh, there, there was a, a blood pressure cutoff, and I was not able to obtain the originally sort of written down blood pressure numbers from charts, so I, instead I asked people what their blood pressure was at their last visit. Well, whether or not they were on antihypertensives was really a function of what was written down in their chart. It's 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 a function, you know, that with with uh, with a whole bunch of other stuff in it in terms of what we, what people self-report uh, blood pressure would be, and so people might, for example, remember more accurately their blood pressure if they were on antihypertensives. So there are things like that where, you know, it, it's not that it has to be a hard measure, um, but it has to be the measure that was used in treatment assignment. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, I'm trying to think of, a, of an example of, a, of where self-report could be used. The challenge with self-report is that if someone knows what the if if someone knows what the um, what what the what the threshold rule is, <laughs> then it's there's a lot of scope for manipulation, and so people you know in 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 studies that look at income. Self, they look at self-reported income. Um, this this comes up sometimes where you have uh, people are reporting income to get just below you know a, a tax threshold or an eligibility threshold for something. And sometimes that density test that I described doesn't quite hold because people, even if that's the actual income value used to determine eligibility, people may not be reporting to to authorities. Their their income quite as accurately because they want to get just below some some threshold. So and, and there's a whole other literature on that kind of manipulative behavior, which is interesting in itself in terms of understanding people's people's motivations. Um, so I, I, I sort of my apologies for the circuitous answer. It's it's possible to use a self-report, 
but it would be difficult to do so because of the potential for manipulation. Um, but it, but one, one would have to assess that in individual circumstance. I, I know that it's important uh, in the analysis of the data uh, to model accurately the relationship between the assignment variable and the outcome. Uh, the examples that you showed, um, in some cases they were linear models, in some cases it looked like they were polynomial models. How do you know when you've modeled that relationship correctly? So, so um, two answers to that. So, so the first is that um, there are different there are different sort of approaches to causal inference in RDE. And the approach that I've discussed described, which is exploiting, con you know, looking at just a treatment effect at the threshold, exploiting possible local random noise in the assignment variable to give you local randomization on either side of the threshold, um, and identifying off of continuity at the threshold. That approach, um, the paper by Han, Todd, and, and, and Vanderclaw in 2001, which is in the in, in, the, in the slides, which, um, which, which I, I, I gather will, will be posted, um, they showed that, the lo that local linear regression is, uh, is, is consistent for, um, for, the, for, the, for that risk difference at the threshold. Um, the, there have been various steps to, to improve, improve the, um, the, the, the you know, approaches to, to choosing the right bandwidth for that local linear regression. But you can imagine if you have a curvilinear shape, then the smaller the bandwidth, the closer that curve is to linear. And so linear, as you get smaller and smaller and smaller, the linear model provides you know, a better and better approximation. And in the latest uh, um, optimal bandwidth approaches, you can actually then correct the estimate for, 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 for that bias in improperly fitting the, the, um, the, the, the curvature of, of the, the line. People have shied away in more recent years from the polynomial approach. And, and the reason is that it's sensitive to the, to, to the behavior of the, of the data away from the threshold. And so, you know, what happens far from the threshold can shape the overall curve of the line, and that ends up shaping what ha you know, shaping the fit of the line at the threshold. And, um, and, and so people have shied away from that approach and, um, and, and, and favored uh, the, the, the local linear regression approach. Um, I, I think the sort of, you know, the, 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 um, st the standard practice is to show robustness to a lot of different specifications. And if the result is not robust, then you start to have questions about whether this is, whether this is a, real, a real finding or not. Several, have, several people have asked, how do you pick a good assignment variable? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, that would be for a prospective study, not, not a retrospective study, where the assignment variable was chosen, presumably, by somebody else. But if you're planning one, how, how, do, you, how do you pick a good assignment variable? Well, you'd like the assignment variable to be continuous, and you'd like the threshold to be to to, to matter. <laughs> so, you know, I, I've I've been approached by students for or, or other uh, collaborators who have something like a you know a seven point depression score, or nine point depression score, and want to use a cutoff on that depression score um, for for RDD. Unfortunately, the, the the sparseness in the you know in just those nine points means that it really doesn't, it's not a great um, application for RDD. You could use, you could combine it with, with pre-intervention data to model the shape of that relationship between that score and the outcome, and then do a sort of difference in differences type approach at different points along the, you know, at, 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 at different values of that score, to sort of difference out any you know, the, the, the pre-existing relationship. That, that would be, that's the direction I would sort of encourage people to go. But if you have just, you know, a few discrete units in your assignment variable, you're not going to be able to, you know, fit, fit you know, you won't be able to fit regression, stable regression lines on either side, and you also, um, 
the sort of theory about taking limits uh, on this continuous variable doesn't quite hold in the same way. So I think one of the interesting things is that often um, the way that risk scores are generated is in a continuous framework, but then they're coarsened. And so, you know, you, you would, you can imagine uh, a student who was working on a readmissions, hospital readmissions intervention, um, where there was a, uh, a risk score that was used as a basis for assigning patients to uh, uh, some additional hand holding, some phone calls, some follow up, some case management. Um, and and what, um, what we encountered was that, you know, the underlying, the, the, the risk score was based on a regression equation that if we had the actual regression equation, we could have had a much more continuous uh, measure of this risk score, but it was then coarsened into these discrete categories, which made the analysis much harder. So I, I, I'm sort of just, I, I'm, 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 I'm aware I'm sort of shifting the, 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 I'm answering a slightly different question, which is not what's a good threshold rule, but what data do we want and do we need to try to get so that we can implement uh, RDD for, for for a given threshold rule, um, but I think that I think that's an important an important consideration. It needs to be continuous. The threshold needs to be known. We'd like enough data on either side of the threshold, and if there's noise in the value of the assignment variable, that's good for that's good for inference. It, 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 it's it's not ideal if you're trying to have a clinical cutoff, right? And so there's actually an interesting case where the clinical optimal risk score, you know, which would very clearly identify high risk and low risk patients, um, is some, in, some, in some ways there's, there's, a, um, there's a tension between that on the one hand and the best you know, risk score for an RDD design, which would be a random number. <laughs> um, which uh, in fact, RDD on a random number is identical to a randomized trial. Right? If you just sort everybody randomly and choose some threshold, that's a randomized trial. Um, so, 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 so you do you do want some noise, but in the absence of noise, you want you want a, a, you want good data on how precisely treatment was allocated, how the threshold, uh, the, the assignment variable uh, was what data were collected and, and and how they were used, and you want access to those original data. Uh, Jacob, I've got, I've got lots more questions, but unfortunately, it's noon and. Uh... We promised our audience that we would stop it. And so uh, I want to thank you for uh, your presentation. Uh, we will share some of these questions uh, with you and encourage you to, to draft brief answers that we could post on our website so that those who were asking them and I didn't get a chance to get to their question uh, would have an opportunity to see an answer. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Dr. Murray. And thank you to everyone who participated in today's webinar. On the Mind the Gap website, prevention.nih.gov slash Mind the Gap, you will find several resources for this talk, including the slides and a list of references. We will also be posting a recording of today's webinar on our website next week. You will receive an email with a link to the recording when it is available. Thank you.